Welcome to Speechless. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. We're glad to have you here. And I got one word for you. That's Benghazi. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, there was a hearing in the House um, Oversight Committee and Government Operations Committee, and it was amazing. It happened last week, uh, and the silence in the press has been unbelievable. But anybody can go watch these hearings by going or Googling the word, uh, find out exactly what happened. Uh, well, sorry, that's the wrong place. <laughs> uh, re the Google reviews of the Megazi attack and unanswered questions. Google that, that will give you the House Oversight Committee where you can watch the videos. It's about, uh, I believe, somewhere five to six hours of video. Uh, but we're going to show you clips of that video that highlight some of the things that were made. And this, in my opinion, is the, it's worse than Watergate. Uh, nobody died with what Nixon did. And the cover-up here is huge and exhaustive. And there's a board called the Accountability Review Board that was to investigate this. But you're going to find out that this investigation was very, very limited, did not interview anybody on the ground, did not interview Hillary Clinton, and it was just uh, a total, uh, well, in my opinion, a cover-up. And so we're going to watch that. But before we get into that, we got a couple updates uh, to talk about. And the first update uh, is regarding uh, Judge Perkins. We talked about him last week, and what was going on with Judge Perkins is that on August 19th in the appellate court, he got slapped down very hard for um, uh, not providing a person with their constitutional rights, and uh, a number of issues that were there. This was Carolyn Rice, and the appellate courts reversed his decision on uh, her criminal case of uh, kidnapping her own child, basically, uh, and put it back into the lower court before Judge Perkins again, before the same prosecutor, and said, hey, we're going to, you know, you do it right this time. Well, this is part of the problems with reversing decisions. They go before the same judge that just gets slapped down, and that judge can be defiant. Well, Judge... Um, uh, Judge uh, Perkins, uh, well, the, the big issue here is the county has decided to dismiss the charges and not prosecute, although that leaves Carolyn Rice. Uh, she spent her time in jail and uh, did her sentence for this uh, deed or whatever it was and has suffered many abuses by the courts and by basically this whole quasi-judicial, civil, uh, criminal, uh, family law court system that we have that is, that is so flawed. And uh, Judge Perkins typically can get away with so much. But uh, this rarely happens uh, that judges get charged with this prejudicial, I shouldn't say charged, but get accused of this prejudicial conduct. And so it's serious business, and I hope David Paul from the Board of Professional, excuse me, from the Judicial Oversight Board uh, goes and looks into this case to see and investigates the actions of Judge Perkins. So Carolyn Nice will not be charged again. Uh, charges are dropped, and that whole public record should go away. Uh, but this is, a, this is a problem, and the courts enter into this problem when public defenders say we're not going to defend you and a client is left to go before the court on their own. Uh, somebody who's had their, all their finances, all their money stripped from them from the family law judges and then they get charged criminally and public defenders say hey we're not defending you. What, I mean you're left to defend yourself and it creates a whole bunch of other problems for the courts and this judge just basically in my opinion flipped out went berserk and denied Carolyn Rice uh, her rights. Now you can go read about this case on carvercountycorruption.com. 
carvercountycorruption.com, this case and many other cases dealing with Carver County, uh, and another case that was uh, just brought forth on Carver County on September 11th, a federal lawsuit was brought against Judge David Knudsen out of Dakota County. And uh, the case number is 0, uh, colon 2013 or 2013 uh, CV2477, filed on September 11, 2013. So if you want to go and look up that case, see what that's about. Uh, but I've had friends before Judge Knudsen, and uh, he is not, in my opinion, an honest judge. And this is, these judges get tied into the system. And in the appellate court, the, it was a two-to-one decision in Shell House, um, in my opinion, as a judge that protects the bench, uh, tries to protect the integrity of the bench, but you do that by covering up things. So uh, that's what took place there. Okay, so just some uh, updates there on what's happening in Carver County and Judge Perkins and uh, he needs to go and so uh, I do have an announcement to make and that is uh, there's a fundraiser I want to keep reminding you of this for Ray Woodstrand he was he is an employee of SEC and he was the individual that was beat up on the east side St. Paul by gang members uh, and a, a group uh, started with a couple women getting into a fight and then that grew large. Ray happened to be walking by and they turned and attacked him, uh, uh, four to five individuals. And so uh, he is now the news on Ray. He's at the Courage Center, and uh, which is a positive step, but he's going through intensive rehabilitation there. And he still, my understanding is he still cannot talk uh, but he can communicate and he can understand what's being said, although there's difficulties in all of that. And so he still has a long, long way to go, but he's improving. <laughs> and uh, this is definitely tra tragic. But uh, October 5th from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock at the Goodrich Golf Dome, uh, that's on White Bear Avenue, about a mile south of Highway 36, there's a fundraiser for him and $20 to come. There's also a silent auction that will be there, Little Caesars Pizza. And I challenge anybody to beat me in miniature golf. Um, I'm really good at, at miniature golf and I, I don't think anybody can beat me. So I want you to come down there and, and tell me that you can beat me and we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, I, I'm just saying. You know, there's the challenge for you. You guys out there that say you're pretty good, come down and take me on because I don't think you can do it. Um, and in the meantime, be giving some money to Ray Woodstrand who needs the financial help because of all the expenses involved in, in this and, is, and taking care of him. So October 3rd, I want to see you there. Uh, just a little update also on the Church of Maplewood, otherwise known as the Maplewood City Council and Maplewood um, um, government. Uh, they're, they're trying to give away your money to uh, the Larkin Dance Studio with an uh, unsecured loan of $100,000 and that can be defaulted on for, you know, whatever reasons. You know, it's just amazing that this has happened. Lack of freedom of association. They're forcing you to associate with something you don't want to associate with. And it's just going to a certain group of people. It's part of the Economic Development Association, or the fund there that you are being taxed on. And it just, it, there's so many things wrong with this, but I just wanted you to know and that this is going on in Maplewood and you need to call your Maple rep Maplewood representatives to say no. We don't need to be giving 100000 to winners and losers and people we pick and choose and it really has nothing to do with economic development in Maplewood. These people just want to spend more money than they have. They want to spend a million five hundred thousand approximately instead of a million four hundred thousand. You know, find a different building. 
uh, yeah, and you'll have your, it, it just makes no sense. So update there. Okay, kind of quickly went through those things, and now we're going to go on to Benghazi. And just to update you, just kind of give you a framework here, we got so much video, and here's the problem. We got an hour and a half of video, <laughs> and it was all that good. Um, but we have to narrow it down here. I'm going to narrow it down on the fly. But just to give you the overview, this is in the House Oversight Committee, uh, chaired by Representative Isa. And uh, the, they were questioning this accountability review board as to what took place in, in Benghazi and their investigation. And so we're going to see uh, a first bit here about uh, you're going to look at Admiral, on clip number one, Admiral uh, Mullen gives his evasive answers. And this is, in my opinion, what he did throughout this hearings, would not answer a question straight. So let's watch this video. Go to the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in the Army, our soldiers live by a... a creed and a warrior ethos that begins with, I will always place the mission first, I will never accept defeat, I will never quit, and I will never leave a fallen comrade behind. I believe that all of our personnel in Benghazi and in Tripoli lived, and in the case of our four heroes, laid down their lives as warriors on that day. Uh, that said, um, Admiral Mullen, I, Admiral Mullen, I think the Navy has something similar to the warrior ethos, but, but the Navy's version of it. Um, I want to go back at over what we've talked about today and um, ask you to just briefly answer my following questions and then I'm going to give you some time to speak um, towards the end. Uh, first, as to the allegation that the four-man team in Tripoli was ordered to stand down, there was no such order. The team was directed to provide security and medical assistance in Tripoli. Is that correct? That's correct. With respect to the allegation that the military could have flown aircraft over Benghazi in a matter of hours, in fact, they would have needed tankers to refuel them, and those tankers were many more hours away. Is that correct? That's correct. In the terms of the allegations by unidentified person who claims to be a special operator that a European Command Special Forces team could have prevented the attacks in Benghazi, that is also incorrect, according to your review and the review of General Dempsey. That's is incorrect. It, that is what you're saying is correct. Thank you. Admiral Mullen, I really don't understand this, you know, because it used to be that when our nation came under attack, we would rally together, and especially, especially our men, around our men and women in uniform. And the allegations that anyone in the military, in the uniform on that day, would ever do anything other than their very best effort to come to the assistance of the men and women in Benghazi and in Tripoli troubles me. Um, you yourself have commanded a, a gasoline tanker, a guided missile destroyer, a guided missile cruiser, you've commanded a cruiser destroyer group, and the United States Navy's second fleet. I would suspect that if you could have personally done anything to get there, you would have yourself, based on your extensive military experience. I, uh, I certainly would have. Admiral, during your interview, you addressed this exact line of questioning. On page 32 of our report, you explain how these accusations affect our military service members, and this is what you said. The line of questioning approached here for those of us in the military that we would consider for a second not doing anything we possibly could just stirs us to our bones because that's not who we are. We don't leave anybody behind. Did you say that? I did. So Admiral, what do you say to those such as my very passionate colleague from Utah who continue to question the integrity, the professionalism, and the motives of our military commanders and our men and women in uniform? You can take as much of my remaining time as you would like. One of the things that uh, has been evident in this review, and certainly even in, in, in congressional testimony for former military, former members of the military, and indeed um, uh, serving uh, foreign service officers, is the uh, that you see is the frustration with the inability to deliver that night, uh, and I think it's universal. And I mean, I can see it in the along the lines of questioning. Um, and I understand that. Uh, you know, I led a force for many years. No one I ever knew in that force that wouldn't give their life to try to save those four individuals, um, uh, and in, including myself. So 
uh, that every, which is one of the reasons I paid so much attention to what could have happened that night from a military standpoint, um, and looked at it as I indicated twice. Uh, there, there really was a time, distance, physics problem uh, that would have prevented us from getting there for what seems to be an extraordinary amount of time. But as I indicated earlier, in particular with the uh, with uh, the F-16s, for example, there are very real requirements in order to do that, not even getting to the point of how do you mitigate the risk. And believe me, there are, you know, the military is willing to go into high-risk places. Um, it just wasn't going to happen uh, in time. What is, to some degree, uh, a little bit ironic uh, in all of this is at the compound we lost two great heroes. And we have talked tonight about, or today about the, the fact that, that they weren't very well armed, the, the security posture wasn't there at all, uh, as it should be. And, and I think rightfully so have criticized that. Uh, at the other compound, we actually had a compound that was incredibly well armed, incredibly well defended, uh, and yet somehow, back to this mortar fire in the middle of the night, we lost two people, which speaks to the, the the challenge that you have creating security in every circumstance. Uh, and those two heroes, again, uh, were individuals that come from a force that I know well. So uh, there is no one I know in the military that didn't do that night all they could and wouldn't do all they could to save those people. Admiral, thank you. All right, I gave I misled you a little bit. That was not the video I was ex I was expecting. I messed up there, um, but this th this was the big uh, piece. You know, that was the Democrat Congresswoman uh, representative giving the setup, and of course the way the questioning was done. Well, the military wouldn't do anything bad. They wouldn't. They would do whatever they could do to help somebody, wouldn't they? You know, that's you don't you don't leave anybody behind, right? And here's all your credentials, and, um, and here, you know, uh, Admiral Mullen was saying, you know, we, we had this inability to deliver to help defend these people. I mean, the big question is, this is 9-11, this is and you don't have uh, a defense ready on 9-11, where year after year we keep getting attacked on 9-11, and you're not fully guarded and alert and ready and something something's going on here and we're going to find later when the hard questioning comes that Admiral Mullen uh, in in this whole thing would not answer a straight question the only time he did was with this uh, representative Duckworth only um, he, she was providing cover for him to give a general, this is our philosophy, we wouldn't, you know, we're ready, we, we want to defend, but, you know, all of a sudden we can't. So th this is bizarre. Um, but let's go uh, then to uh, Senator uh, or, or Representative Gobar, Dr. Gobar, uh, and hear his comments. And I'm a private sector guy, so I mean, I mean, this mortifies me what I've just seen here because accountability is in very implicit. I mean, you're going to have stack up attorneys, you're going to have depositions, you're going to have transcriptions. You don't get a go pass go and collect $200. That doesn't work in the private sector, you know. So, um, from the standpoint of the records that um, that there, we've been talking about at this ARB, the State Department is withholding those interview summaries that have come out because there's no transcriptions, but you know, there has been a recorded uh, log. In order for Congress to do its job, we should have the access to those, should we not? I think that's probably a question more for Admiral Mullen and Ambassador Pitt. Oh, no, I'm asking you. I, yes, I, I believe so. How do you feel about that, Mr. Sullivan? You know, I would agree that if these are documents that uh, Congress is entitled to, that they should have them to uh, review as well. How about that, Admiral Mullen? Uh, again, I have a longstanding history in in terms of uh, providing documents when requested, and I think it's something that's got to be worked out between the bill. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't need to be worked out. I mean, it's our due diligence, sir. I mean, accountability. I mean, I'm, t I'm talking to a man who's, who's very accountable and th through his whole lifetime has been that way. But the mantra in this place, in this beltway, needs to change. There needs to be accountability. One of the so I, I would hope that you would genuinely I come forward um, and say, absolutely, 
those I, records should be turned over. I have lived my life uh, focusing uh, on accountability. And I know. So I feel it, very strongly about it. I would that. expect you to say uh, absolutely yes that those, that those records should be turned over to Congress. I mean, from, from what I have ever seen and I have ever heard of you, that you would say absolutely accountability and transparency should be there. And I personally, you, Admiral Mullen, would uh, see it uh, right that turn those records over. I have, uh, believe me, I am right where you think I am with respect to accountability. The issue of the specifics of what is inside that has to be worked out, specifically with re respect to records. I mean, I have been in departments that for reason, whatever the reason is, they, they uh, don't provide or take a long time. And I am not privy, quite frankly, to the specifics of why those are not being provided right now. So you oh, don't like the status so, quo? So, no, I'm, no I'm, I think that what, where we were in the ARB was to try to get to the best position we could with respect to accountability driven by the law, quite frankly. I understand, but part of and that accountability is the oversight of Congress and, and part of the oversight of Congress for implementation. Because we have seen this, this timeline of ineptitude of implementing, um, implementing these, actually, these, these discussions from previous actions. And part of that is that we are not getting part of the records to actually have that oversight, because legislating is not just budgets. The gentleman's it's also time about has expired. The, this. I, I think oversight to ensure implementation and execution in the long term makes a lot of sense. I thank the Admiral. Uh, with all right. Uh, State Department has interviews, uh, tape recordings, uh, no transcripts, and they aren't being given to the House of Representatives. Uh, so this is, in my opinion, part of the cover-up that's taking place. And there you see a little bit of uh, Admiral Mullen parsing things out uh, to the point of not getting the information that needs to have gotten. We are going to find out in the next clip 2A uh, where um, he is actually working on behalf of the State Department instead of doing an independent investigation with the next three uh, clips kind of demonstrate that that is what is going on here. Uh, there is a problem with his independent investigation when he is tipping off the State Department of what Congress is trying to accomplish. So let us see the first uh, clip. Starting now. I thank the Chairman uh, for his generosity. The, uh, Admiral Mullen, in, we learned earlier that in the very first week of the uh, ARB being formed, you gave Cheryl Mills a heads up because you felt Charlene Lamb, who was coming to testify in front of this committee, was, quote, in response to Mr. DeSantis' question, a weak witness. So my question is real simple. Why should you care? Why does it matter? Weak, if she was a str weak, strong witness, short witness, tall witness, male witness, female witness, why in the heck does it matter? Your job is to figure out what took place at the State Department, not to decide what kind of representative the State Department sends in front of a congressional committee. I so why in the heck did you care? I indicated before that I did that having nothing to do with the ARB and having everything to do with the fact that I would run departments, provided witnesses. Let me ask you this. If she was a strong the, witness, if she was going to convey a, a good light for the State Department, would you have called up I Cheryl would, Mills and say, hey, Charlene Lamb is going to knock it out of the park. I, you know what? Make sure you coach her and get her ready and send her in front. She is going to be, she's going to be stellar. Would you have called Cheryl Mills then? I, had she been, in my interpretation at that, or judgment at that point, had she, was she going to be a strong witness? No. So, when, so the only reason you called was because she was going to be a weak witness and convey a bad light on the State Department? The only reason I called was to give her a heads up that I thought the Department could be better represented at the hearing. Let me walk through. Wow. <laughs> That's just incredible. He says his call had nothing to do with the ARB, uh, the um, uh, Accountability Review Board. Yet he's the one in charge of this Accountability Review Board, and he has that information because he's part of the Accounta Re Accountability Review Board, the ARB. And so he calls them knowing he's under an, in charge of an investigation, but he called not having nothing to do with the Accountability Review Board. Unbelievable. That right there, this guy should be in trouble. Um, all right, let's go to the next clip. Utah. 
Isn't it true that you were selected, you were notified by Cheryl Mills that you were going to serve on the ARB? Correct. So Cheryl Mills called you up, she, said, she Admiral actually, Mullen, I want you to serve on the board. A week into the formation of the board, you call her back up and you say, hey, Cheryl Mills, the lady who's about to go in front of the committee that has jurisdictions looking in this is going to be a terrible witness. You need a heads up on this. And oh, by the way, at the end of the report, before it goes public, you get Cheryl Mills and Hillary Clinton a chance to look at the report and make edits if they want to. Uh, they, and yet, 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 wait, 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 I forgot one important point, maybe the most important point. In your opening statement, you said we are, uh, we, that you said you operated and the board operated independent. We did. Okay. Independent. All right. Well, I just want to make it clear. I yield my time, and, gentlemen, from Utah. And, and sec the only thing I'd like to comment with respect to what you said in the last statement was in the normal process, as we reported out, we were done with the report and we went to Secretary Clinton to give her a briefing on the report. It was hers to take, that was the tasking, and hers to choose what to do with, she chose to sign it out. And Admiral, that's all fine, but don't convey it as, as independent. If they picked, if Cheryl Mills picked you, you gave her heads up within days of starting and you let him look at the report and edit the report at the end, that's all fine if that's the way the statute reads, but don't try to tell us that it's independent. Ms. Mills didn't pick me. She called me and asked me to do this for the Secretary. Okay, Secretary. that's not picking. All right, I got the it. The gentleman from Utah. <laughs> so here's this investigation uh, that Congress wanted, and it's done by this independent agency, yet they're... Admiral Mullen is given the State Department all these heads up, here's what we're going to do, here's the interviews, but to the Congress, to the legislature, to the House of Representatives, not the legislature, but to the House of Representatives, he is saying, uh, we're, we're not going to give you these in a, we, we didn't give you these in a timely manner, we didn't, we're not giving you our information, we're not giving you transcripts, we're not giving you tape recordings, we're not, um, from what I can tell here, we're leaving you out of the picture F from what I see. So Congress has left, the, the House of Representatives is left having to go through third sources, ulterior sources, rather than this review board. But the review board is more than happy to give all the information to the State Department and give them a heads up on what's going on. Uh, unbelievable. Now, here comes the big news on this, which just floors me. You understand how this, who's getting the information before the people's branch of government, the, the, the House of Representatives? Let's see who gets the information first. Let's watch the I, next I clip. just have to ask as a follow-up to that, you testify that Charlene, you, Charlene Lamb you thought was honest. You're not questioning your integrity. So why, what made her a weak witness? It was just my reaction from having sat down with her for a couple of hours at that particular point in time. So she's honest, she's full of integrity, but that made her a weak witness? Well, I, I, my, my sense was, uh, Mr. Chavis, my sense was that she had not appeared before. This was not, certainly, it certainly wasn't routine from that standpoint. Uh, and it was not, uh, and I, you know, I just ask you, you have to ask you to believe me, it was not certainly intended to never put her in front of the committee, or at least speak to that. This is the problem. You, you, with all due respect, you make, in your fourth paragraph of your testimony, you go to great lengths about the unfettered access, the ability to talk to people. We didn't get that same privilege. We don't have that on this same panel. The President of the United States stood before the American people and said that he would, he would uh, quote, I think it is important to find out exactly what happened in Benghazi, and I'm happy to cooperate in any way that Congress wants, end quote. That's never happened. It doesn't happen in this panel. It doesn't happen from the State Department. That's part of the frustration. I don't mean to single you out at all. I, I appreciate you being here and what you've done in your career. But we still don't have the answers to the very basic things. The video, or the lack of a video, is kind of an important element to what happened or didn't happen in Megazi. You didn't even look at that. Now, I need to ask Mr. Sullivan, because part of the reason that you're, you and Mr. Kyle are here is because we saw in Al Jazeera, of all places, the independent panel on best practices. You convened this panel at the recommendation of the ARB. You started this panel back in April, correct, Mr. Sullivan? Yes, sir. When did you complete your work? Uh, we completed our work um, 
just before the report came out, which would have been the end of uh, August, beginning of uh, September. Who specifically, I want to name, did you give this report to? The report is dated August 29th, 2013. This report is dated then. Yes, sir. Who did you hand this to? Uh, the report was handed to uh, Greg Starr, who's the, uh, the acting OSEC. and, uh, and um, who, OSEC. I'm sorry, who is he? Uh, we presented actually under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. We were legally bound to present the report to the Overseas Security Advisory Committee, which is a FACA exempt group, and their executive council had to take a look at the report before it could officially go to the Department of State. Has it gone to the Department okay, of your State? Time, your time has expired. Let's have to be the last question. I, I don't know. I, I would ask my friend, the, the ranking member, if he would be okay to just finish this line of questioning. Please, Department if I can have an additional minute. The, the Without objection, so ordered. The Department of State does have the report. One of my fundamental challenges and problems is the United States Congress doesn't have this report. It's been almost a month. We don't have this report. And yet the first time it comes out, to the best of my knowledge, is on Al Jazeera? That's where we got to get this stuff? Uh, and so, know, Congressman, I think that was really unfortunate that uh, that's... Do you know how it happened? I do not, and uh, believe me, that, um, that I believe that's extremely unfortunate that that report came out that way. Um, State Department, quite frankly, didn't even have a chance to look at that report before it was, um, be before that came so out. So who's going to investigate how Al Jazeera gets a copy of it before the State Department or the United States Congress gets to it? Where did it go? You... You're the head of, you used to be the head of the Secret Service. You know how this stuff works. How did this happen? Uh, sir, all I know is that uh, we provided this report. As, uh, as Greg said, I was not there uh, that day. I was out of town. But this report was uh, provided to the uh, representative from the, uh, the Overseas uh, Security Advisory Committee. And uh, the next thing we knew, within two days, uh, that report had been, um, had been leaked out. I, I do hope for those State Department officials, Mr. Chairman, as I wrap up, the State Department officials that are here in this room that are listening to this to understand this, they have got to get to the bottom of this. And we still, as the United States Congress, have to get a copy of this. For Al Jazeera to have it a month almost before us is just not acceptable. You'll Amazing. You know, not even Fox News is covering that. There, I have not seen a clip on this. So two days after the report was handed, to uh, this Greg Stern, I believe his name was, this overseas, I, you know, whatever this long name was, and to the Department of State, to the State Department, um, it was leaked out. You got the, I mean, if anybody knows what's going on, it's these guys that are being questioned uh, by, by the House, uh, U.S. House of Representatives. And, yeah, it's extremely unfortunate. That's the comment Mr. Sullivan said, and I think he's, there has to be an investigation on that. Who leaked that out? Because that's terrible. Congress had still not been given a copy, is my understanding. The copy he got was from Al Jazeera. Um, wow. <laughs> this is, and even Fox News isn't covering this. You get it here. Un unbelievable. Okay, there was four hours of this type of questioning in the House of Representatives, four and a half to five hours of questioning, and you're going to want to watch it again. Go Google reviews of the Benghazi attack and unanswered questions, House Operation uh, and Oversight Committee. Uh, unbelievable. I watched the Watergate hearings, this, and the Iran-Contra, this, is more fascinating than any of that. Very entertaining. Um, but the last half was, uh, excuse me, there was one hour uh, of this testimony uh, beyond the four and a half hours to five hours. That was about with the parents of some of the guys that got killed. And uh, I want you to hear what they had to say. And I think uh, my personal opinion, Hillary Clinton will not run for president. I think she's done. Uh, ben, the word Benghazi will be equated to Hillary Clinton. When you say Hillary Clinton, the next word will be Benghazi. Or if you say Benghazi, the next word will be Hillary Clinton. Uh, she is done. And uh, it's Mrs. Smith, a U.S. citizen, to bring her down. Here's her testimony uh, before uh, the U.S. House of Representatives. Um. 
I don't exactly know what to say. I have been ignored by the State Department. I've been told I was unimportant. And I had to find everything I know by going on the internet and asking questions. Because nobody from the government has gotten back to me to tell me anything. And that, that I mean that by saying anything. And it, it's, it's been, I hate to put it in the record, but it, it, it's been pure hell living through all this and not getting any answers. I wanted to be able to put everything beside me and, and have everything go away. But I can't do that because I don't have plenty of answers that I need. One silly question that I have is, every time I see this on TV, I see these bloody fingerprints crawling down the wall of that Benghazi place. And I keep asking everybody, Are there, uh, do those belong to my son? And nobody has told me anything. One person says, no, it's not them, it's not him. But this is the kind of answers I get. Are those his bloody fingerprints? And I know you people can't answer that now. But this is how it feels. And it feels terrible. I want answers. I want to know what happened with my son. And I know you can't tell me anything classified, but tell me something. The only thing, but I, I do, wait a minute, I take that back. I apologize. I was told a few things, and they were all lies. Obama and Hillary and Panetta and Biden and uh, Susan all came up to me at the casket ceremony. Every one of them came up to me, gave me a big hug, and I asked them, what happened? Please tell me. And every one of them says, it was the, the video. And we all know that it wasn't the video. Even at that time, they knew it wasn't the video. So they all lied to me. But what they said was, I will check up on it and get back to you for sure. And you know how many times I heard from them? None. I don't count. People of America don't count. The only thing that counts is their, their own selves and their own jobs. And the people that are involved in this get suspended for a short time, paid the whole time, and then rehired or whatever it is that they do. I want to know what happened to my son. Why can't these people tell me this? I, I'm sorry, I'm ranting. All right. Now, one person uh, just texts in and says that uh, MSN will cover Hillary Clinton with the Teflon shield. And, well, yeah, they're going to ignore this, uh, what, which is what's happening now. But here you saw it, and it's up to you people to get the word out. And they can't hide this. This will get out, and, and it will eventually come to light. And what this lady said, they lied. Even though they knew what had happened, they lied to her and said it was because of this videotape. Uh, and they knew it was a lie at the time, but they kept lying. And they know the answer, and they're covering it up, and we're going to find out later why. Now we're going to hear uh, from Mr. Woods, uh, another father, a father of uh, son's name was Ty Woods, uh, who was killed, and hear what he has to say. Um, this tie right here is special to me. It was worn at my son's funeral, and I only wear it on special occasions. And this right here, I trust, is something special that's happening. The other thing that's special that's happening is after Ty was, went home to be with the Lord, uh, I really was concerned about his son that was born just, he only saw for a very brief time before he left on assignment, how he'd be doing. And after one year, we spent the day with him yesterday. Uh, that was the one ray of sunshine through the clouds this week. So two special things have happened here, and I thank you for what you're doing. It's been over a year since four brave Americans were tragically killed in Benghazi. And after one year, we know very few answers that we uh, have been asking for the last year. We don't know much more than we did a year ago. Two of my heroes while growing up were John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Reverend King made the statement 
that justice delayed is justice denied. It has been over a year. We have no justice, and we have very few truthful answers that have been provided. Public testimony is necessary in front of a committee such as this so that the American people can get the truth. So I thank you very much for what you are doing here. Now, voters, they need to know the truth about what happened in Benghazi in order to protect America's freedoms. Now, a lot of people, unfortunately, say that we can't tell the people the truth. We have to answer, I can't answer that question, such as the ambassador did. There are too many of these witnesses that are testifying behind closed doors, and we don't know what they said. We don't see their faces on TV to tell whether they are not they are credible witnesses. We don't see whether or not the right questions were asked to get to the truth or whether meaningless questions were asked instead. So it is very important that we have public testimony by credible witnesses with firsthand, not hearsay, knowledge of the situation. That is why it is imperative that you call people like General Hamm. You call people like Ty's friends who have contacted various committees and wanted to testify through their attorney but have not been issued subpoenas. There are people out there that have firsthand knowledge, and public testimony is necessary. The voters need to have the truth about Benghazi so that the voters can protect the freedom of America. All right. Mr. Woods was giving, he just sat through the four and a half hours and heard everything that was said, um, which was interesting because when you heard uh, Doc, uh, Representative Duckworth's questions and the answer coming from Admiral Mullen, uh, that there was no order to stand down. The military did everything they could, yet Mr. Woods just said there was an order to stand down. And uh, it, you know, it, it's amazing. And of course, what also didn't happen is that uh, this our board did not interview anybody on the ground that was there. Nobody did not interview Hillary Clinton. Didn't think it was necessary. They just took the word of the people in the middle, and uh, they had found no reason to interview anybody else. Uh, it's. It's amazing. We just had too much video, so I don't know that we're going to get that. But let's go to the next uh, clip, which deals with a lot of the unanswered questions. Number five. <clears throat> After one year, there are certain questions that I would like to have answered. Recently, I sent a letter to the president who offered to reach out for answers. Some of the questions I ask, um, I would like to direct to this body as well. I am the father of Ty Woods, who was killed while heroically defending the American consulate in Benghazi. These are some of the questions. Who made the decision to stand down, and when and why was that decision made? Now, there is some conflict as to whether or not there was a dis uh, an order to stand down. There are very credible sources that say that Ty and five of his Special Forces workers were denied three times. Once they went, were denied. They waited a certain period of time. Second time, they were denied. They waited another period of time. Third time, they were denied. They went anyway. We need to ask the people that were there, not rely upon hearsay evidence as to whether or not there was an order to stand down. More importantly, we also need to find out who it was that gave that order to stand down and why that order was given to stand down. The admiral of the former admiral of the Pacific Fleet said that in all of his decades of service, this has never happened where a rescue attempt was at not at least attempted immediately. 
And immediately does not mean the next day. Immediately does not mean eight, nine, ten hours later. <clears throat> when is also important because Admiral Steve, or I'm sorry, Ambassador Stevens was alive for a substantial period of time after he made that initial distress call. It's very possible that there would have been no loss of life if that first order to stand down had not been given. We need to find that out. Another question, is it true that General Ham was relieved from duty for refusing to follow the order not to rescue? I have had a general tell me that according to his intel, that General Ham was relieved of duty because immediately after the distress call was relayed to him, he was told to stand down. And his words, according to this general, were, I don't speak like this, screw it. And within moments, General Ham was relieved of his duty by an inferior officer. Now, the spin that was given by the administration was that this was a pre-scheduled rotation of generals. Well, I think it's an insult <clears throat> to the intelligence of the American community to say <clears throat> that a general in the middle of a battle would be relieved because of a pre-scheduled rotation, and especially by an inferior officer. We need to have that direct testimony by General Ham, and it needs to be public so that the public, so that the voters can view the credibility of who's telling the truth. Because the ARB contradicts that and says that there was not any denial of support by anyone from Washington at page 37. Finally, this is a very personal question to me, but a very important question, and that is, if the president's child were in Benghazi, would the rescue attempt have been more aggressive? There are very, there's very strong evidence of what the answer to that question is, and I will let every American make that decision for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, there you heard it. I, have you heard this? I, I mean, General Ham relieved the duty because of refusing to stand do down and at gunpoint by an inferior, an inferior officer was told to be gone. <laughs> you're, you're done. Wow. Any, did, you ever, did you see it in the headlines anywhere? Where's this General Ham? Uh, oh, but it was a pre-scheduled rotation of generals at gunpoint. All right. Something really is wrong going on here. We're going to see clip number six here. Uh, Representative Isa saying we're, we're starting to subpoena now. There's a process that has to go through here. And you got to listen to the Arbor first. Uh, now they've been heard. Everything's wide open. Uh, so subpoenas are being issued. Let's hear what uh, Representative Isa has to say. Uh, you know, we're the we're essentially the Select Committee on Investigations here in the House, and we have a counterpart in the Senate. We have a long history of doing investigations, and sometimes people talk about us writing subpoenas and, and demanding people and hauling people before this committee. Uh, and we don't walk away from that. Sometimes it's necessary. Today, I want you to know that just today, I signed subpoenas for Alec Henderson and John Martinick. Thank you. Uh, if there are additional witnesses who have facts and were on the ground and want us to issue subpoenas, if their names could be provided to us, we will do so. We are issuing the subpoenas for these two individuals because the State Department has repeatedly lied in how they reflected these people's availability, saying that they were available if they wanted to come forward. Well, a spokesperson in the press office, after repeatedly being asked by press officials, not us, but press, press officials, essentially created the obvious slant, which was 
that these individuals were free to come forward, but there was a criminal investigation and they might harm it. We finally have reached the end of our rope after repeated requests for these individuals. In fact, their names have never been formally given to us, but rather a large stack of information delivered to us as classified, well, in fact, on their face being unclassified, is guarded by a State Department official and we may not make copies of it. Instead, we were able to find from open source the names of these individuals and we today subpoenaed them. I wonder if that open source was Al Jazeera. <laughs> uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, okay, so they are going to subpoena. That's the big news. Okay, we're going to go, uh, we're running out of time here. Um, I'm going to bring pro-life movement in here. This is this is important, Mrs. Smith, number 15. Um, here's here's what she had to say about her son. I I was 38 before I even had him. I was told I couldn't have kids, but my family called him Patsy's kid because that that was my kid, my miracle baby. Well, my miracle baby was abandoned in Benghazi that I couldn't spell before, but I can now. And he was a, I, I, I don't know what to say about him. He was just a wonderful kid. And I love the hell out of him, and I always will. I, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, you see, the, the uh, Planned Parenthood, the abortion industry, if you're 38, my mom was 42 when she had my brother uh, told to abort the child. You know, it's, it's just going to be all kinds of problem. You know, these, these people for abortion are evil. That's the bottom line. Their, their hearts are evil. And uh, here you have a, a, a man who represented his country well, fought for our liberties, uh, actually went against... Uh, the orders to stand down, as we understand it, because he knew the government was doing wrong. We need more people like that. Of course, it's a pro-life people that are going to put these kind of men together. That's why the abortionists want him dead before they even see the take a breath. And uh, of course, I have a brother who's fantastic. Uh, a lot of condolences went out to the parents and. Uh, uh, to go to number 16, Representative Lankford uh, just was really, was really right on. A number of these people were, but let's hear what Representative Lankford had to say. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford. Bless you all for a very long day. I cannot imagine what it was like to uh, start the travel here and uh, to know that the destination was going to end up right here where you are right now uh, after a very, very long day. Uh, so thank you. Um, I am uh, overwhelmed with Psalm 34:18, where it says, The Lord is near the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I pray that for you and for your family, uh, that you will experience the, the closeness and the nears, nearness of God and the comfort that only he can provide in this. Here's another city you may not be able to spell, Mrs. Smith. Like Benghazi, all of us learned how to spell that. We woke up Oklahoma. Wewoka, Oklahoma, is a tiny little town in my district. And in August, I held a town hall meeting in Wewoka, Oklahoma, a town you've never heard of until just now. And they asked me about Benghazi. And they wanted to know, in small town Oklahoma, what's being done to get the facts out and hold people in Libya that did this to account. There are people all over the country that care deeply about this, small towns and big towns, and they stand with you. And uh, I thought you needed to know that today, that the good folks in Wewoka, Oklahoma, care deeply about what's going on, as well as in big towns. Well, you need to look it up. Yeah, go to Oklahoma City and move east, and you'll find Wewoka out there. So grateful that y'all are here. Thank you uh, for being a part of this day, and uh, please keep us informed of the questions that you have. Uh, it is important that you receive what you were promised, and that's the facts and the truth. And uh, we want to help in that in every way we can, without a yield back. 
Well, it, you know, uh, yeah, our heart goes out to their family as they grieve, and uh, Representative Gowdy was right on. There's no closure in this. You, you didn't hear him speak, but he said there's no closure, and there will not be closure, but you will learn to deal with it, and uh, your heart should con be concerned over Benghazi, and otherwise, if your heart does not burn with concern over Benghazi, you'll be like Hillary Clinton and just say, what, what does it matter? And of course, that's why the comment and the question that uh, Mr. Woods had about his son and his question to the president, if it was your child in Benghazi, what would you have done something? What would you have done? You would have done everything you could have done. Of course, one of the jokes out there is uh, have uh, Chelsea Clinton be the next ambassador to Libya and live in Benghazi. We'll see what happens. But, that, you know, I think that's mean-spirited, but it gets to a point that uh, our men, uh, a lot of discrepancy took place, and our men uh, were left behind regardless of what other people said. All right. Uh, October 5th fundraiser for Ray Woodstrand, a uh, man beaten up on at uh, on Eastside St. Paul. Uh, Goodrich Golf Course, 10 to 3 o'clock. like to see you there. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Sets on fire